Leaning in and helping others while shining a spotlight on the global mental health crisis. Tonight, two top doctors come together with two of the biggest names on Broadway to highlight the importance of the human connection. The message, when we all come together, this is how we can change the world. Je ne vais l'hôpital de faire que je me dis que j'ai des maladies qui me fait. Mais celles qui ont été faites pour moi, c'est uniquement préparer tout le testament. Je ne vais pas aller ici de l'hôpital quand je. Le docteur Polo a dit non. Je ne peux pas mourir. J'ai été à Haïti en 1983. Je n'ai pas commencé la médecine. J'ai rencontré les gens qui seraient mes meilleurs amis et mes amis co-workers. I had never seen such abject misery in my life. We started going house to house and people were so sick. And I thought, how can we get this fixed? Jim and Paul were constantly going back and forth and they would borrow things from some of the hospitals. I would put that medicine in these big suitcases. They usually thought I was a tourist. As soon as we opened the clinic doors, it was every possible disease you could imagine. She's dying. I think it's too late. This was life or death. Getting medicine down there was life or death. And everything was conspiring against us. The scientific community hated it. They said, it's not sustainable, it's silly, this could never be replicated. We could not administer the program because we don't have the doctors. In this script, we are uneducated, of course, stupid. If you've traveled to rural Africa, you know this. People do not know what watches and clocks are. None of our patients have died. One person died a few days after starting therapy because we started too late. It took us from being outsiders right into the middle of the debate. The results were dramatic and transformative. We decided this could be something like a movement. We know there is just a worldwide mental health epidemic. The schools are bursting at the seams with youth at younger and younger ages that are evidencing greater psychopathology in kindergarten, first grade, second grade. For many, many years, they didn't see it, and now these kids are showing mental health problems very early in life. This worldwide problem is not getting better. It's not going away. And I feel like those of us in the field who have been doing this work for a long time have a duty and responsibility to try to make a change and do some interventions earlier in these people's lives. The advantage of DBT in schools is that not only is it good for the students, but it is actually life-changing for the staff, whether it be the providers of the school psychologists and social workers or the teachers who are working with the students. If you learn these skills yourself as a teacher or as a provider in a school district, you're already learning ways to regulate your own emotions, be more mindful, being able to cope with all kinds of stress that has otherwise been burning you out. And advantage number two is, if your students are learning coping skills that they've never learned before, they'll be able to sit in your classroom. They'll be able to cope with their distress, and instead of having to run out of the classroom and go to the assistant principal's office and spend the day not learning, they can actually take out a crisis survival toolkit and figure out how can I manage my distress at the desk and then refocus on my teacher's education plan for the day. So it has the double advantage of the, the school staff better managing their own emotions and distress, the students managing their emotions and distress better. It's a win-win. My dream of dreams is to be able to bring these life skills into schools at earlier ages so we can start at late elementary or even middle school. We need to equip these young people with tools much earlier if we're going to save lives and change lives. In the world of musical theater, there's nothing like it. Pasek and Paul 
are the, with a capital T-H-E, the great young team working in theater right now. They have found a way through their songs to reflect the feelings and the times and the circumstances of the world that we live in. Oscar goes to Benj Pasek and Justin Paul for City of Stars. Thankfully, we found Justin and Benj. They've yeah. since won an Oscar for La La Land. They've won the Tony for Dear Evan, Dear Hansen. Evan Hansen. They just got three Grammy Award nominations and they no longer talk to me. I can't believe we just won a Grammy and we're in the room with all of you guys. This is insane. It's hard to categorize them because they really can do anything. They are truly two greats of their generation. Watching their creative process has been inspiring. There's no question they're going to be mainstays in the entertainment industry for a long time to come. Welcome, everybody. Great to see you. Great to see you all here tonight. We are so fortunate, so, so fortunate to have this extraordinary panel right here right here with us. I'm hoping we come away enlightened and inspired to take this thing on, and I got a feeling we will. I think we're already inspired after the video, so why don't we jump right into it? Um, I wanna start, guys, by what brought you to this space? What brought you to the mental health space? And Dr. Miller, I'm gonna call you Alec, actually, because that's how we know each other. Um, start, start with that for us. My story is this. When I was 17 years old, my father called a family meeting. My sister, myself, my mother, we never had a family meeting in my life. Tonight, what's the family meeting? I have to tell you something my father said. The story about your grandfather is not true. What I told you about him dying from a heart attack before I, before I was born, Alec was born, is actually not true. He died by suicide. So my father tells me when he was 17 years of age, his father worked at Gimbel's department store in Manhattan, got fired, went home to Long Island, went down to the basement, and unbelievably hanged himself there, and my father found him. So my father tells me this at 17, I'm about to go to college, and I don't understand, how does somebody do this? How does somebody who is a father of three children, my dad's 17, the eldest of three, choose to take your life? What kind of psychic pain is that? So I, I needed to understand that. And were there no risk factors that nobody could identify? And what treatments would my grandfather have had if he were to get to, to care? So I went to, to Michigan, I became a psychology major, I went to graduate school, and an opportunity arose when, uh, at Montefiore Medical Center to direct a clinic for suicidal and depressed teenagers. I'm like, this is it, this is my moment. I can start to do something with purpose here. But then I realized, I don't know what I'm doing. The residents and interns said, Alec, what are we supposed to do? This is serious suicidal behavior in an outpatient clinic. I worked inpatient, now what do we do? I looked at the literature. There was not a single study, not one study, that showed any effectiveness to help suicidal kids. So I said, holy cow, we gotta figure this out. So I heard about dialectical behavior therapy at the University of Washington with Marshall Linehan for suicidal adults. We began training in that, getting adapting it for teenagers, black and brown youth in the Bronx, New York, and Montefiore, and it turned out to be an incredible opportunity. It was working, people wanted to hear about it, we wrote about it, we just researched it, and now it is the only evidence-based treatment for suicidal youth in the, in, since it was inception, inception 20 years ago. At the end of the day, did you come to some understanding of your grandfather, who you never met, right? Right. Or are you still on that journey? Uh, I, I basically have empathy for him, I feel sad for the fact that he was struggling, I'm guessing, silently. I never really got a, a clear understanding from my father or the family exactly what happened. But I, I do know that we need to support people just by asking, how are you doing? Are you okay? And listening, really listening, in a true way, not just, hey, good, I'm good, hey, good, 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 I'm good. No, we have to really lean in to people who we have any concerns about. So there's a lot more I can say about that, but that's a little bit about how I got to be here today. Sure. Um, Dr. Kim, we heard your long resume, varied resume, 
um, you know, Dartmouth, World Bank, treating and, and helping people with TB and AIDS in developing nations. What brings you to the mental health space? Well, you know, uh, you, you saw in the movie, um, I started the organization with a bunch of people, but it was really uh, Paul Farmer and myself. And Paul and I were both, we, we were both doing medical degrees and, and anthropology degrees. And um, uh, early on, and once we got to know each other, I was doing my field research in Korea. I mean, I, I came when I was a, to the country when I was a very young uh, boy, so I wanted to sort of re-engage with Korea. So I was in Korea. He was in Haiti. And then we met sort of um, in 1984 or so, and uh, we started talking about, well, so what, should we, what, what is the nature of our responsibility? And Paul would say, you know, Jim, we're both getting MD, PhDs, and this is a guy who grew up on a bus in a swamp in Florida. Uh, and he said, uh, don't you think we have some sort of responsibility uh, given our, what he called, ridiculously elaborate educations? And so we started talking, and we decided that what we were going to do is uh, start this small little organization, Partners in Health. We never thought we'd raise any money, but we thought, you know, we're just we're going to stay on the side of the poorest. We're going to work in Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. We're going to insist on uh, good quality health care, and we're just going to sort of tough it out, even though we, th we think we're going to be on the losing side. But then we started running into uh, just the, the, the direct um, uh, arrogance of people in the global health, public health world who just uh, would write off, uh, uh, just out of hand, it's impossible to treat a multidrug resistant TB. It's impossible to treat HIV. You saw that, uh, the video. The head of the US Agency for International Development said, it is impossible to treat HIV in Africa because Africans have no sense of time. They don't know how to look at watches. They they, and so, clocks. you know, I have good, very good friends in South Africa who said, well, you know, uh, his name was Andrew Natsios. Uh, Mr. Natsios came to visit uh, um, Johannesburg, and he was the only one that was late to every meeting, right? <laughs> but, you know, the, him, he was only speaking on behalf of his physicians who were telling him it's impossible. And we sat there and we thought, okay, so there's 25 million people in Africa living with HIV. We have these amazing medicines that uh, we, we created. I mean, some of the people here will remember how sick people were who had HIV and how little hope there was. We had these great medicines, and the entire, the entire co community of uh, physicians in infectious disease said it's impossible to do this. So it just made us furious. And we started saying, we were anthropologists, we said, you know, if we let 25 million people in Africa die because we think it's inconvenient, it's too complicated, if we do that, we will always be remembered as a generation that, st that sat by passively. A passive genocide will happen in those countries. And so we said, we don't know if we can do anything about it, but we're gonna treat people in Haiti. We begged, borrowed, and stole to get the drugs. And then when we started showing the before and after pictures, it started to move people, including Tony Fauci. Tony Fauci became an advocate for us. He took us to the White House. We showed these before and after pictures, and it moved George Bush. And then, you know, the rest of this is there are almost 30, 30 million people on treatment for HIV. And they, when I was at WHO, they would scream and yell at me and say, it's not possible to do it. I came to mental health because I think that's where we are with mental health. I think there is a belief that you can't, you can't get better than 6% uh, 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 it's a curate, if you will, Tom Insel, Healing, everybody read this book, an, an important book. Tom, Tom uh, wrote, writes in this book that about 40% of people with mental illness get treatment. And of those, only 40% get treatment that's minimally acceptable. So you're down to 16%. And of those 16%, only a third truly get better. So we're at 6%. 6% of the people with mental illness in this country get better. This is a human rights violation, and, and, and it seems to me that because it's the brain and we still blame people for it, we are now standing by as people suffer just horrifically. And I, I feel like this is like 1999 for HIV. We're, we're living in the same sort of haze, so we need some kind of social movement. I've already called all my friends in the HIV community. We're doing so well in HIV, they're looking for something to do. <laughs> I, I think this is it. I so think so you think it. you have the blueprint to pull this well, off? I, it's, it's not a blueprint because it's not a blueprint because this is different. I'm now meeting people who don't want to resign 
And I, I, you know, we've just had experience being subversive, being disruptive, taking on powerful forces that say things can't be done. And I think that's what we need to do right now. We've got to get a little militant about it. And we've got to ask ourselves, where is true disruption going to come from? Militant. I like that. <laughs> All right, Bench and Justin, this started in high school for you guys, quite by accident. Tell us. After you, what sir. What do you got? So guys, we're just, a, just a level set, we're, we're between these two people, we feel like we're like the comic relief. Can we all panel. acknowledge what's happening now? We're it's just like, like, this guy cured that, and he saves this, and, and we, we wrote, wrote, this is me. We're just but like, every party needs a couple clowns, you know what I mean? So We're the resident jesters. Yeah, we're happy tonight. to fulfill that role. We, I we would just, give it all up if we, I could write one song. Uh, <laughs> please don't. Oh, my God. Um, uh, uh, yeah, we we're, we're, we've just keep saying to Harris, this is just a big prank on us this entire, like, you're all part of this ruse. Um, uh, but um, we met uh, that, that first day among a bunch of other majors. We happened to be in the same group uh, and sort of hit it off uh, as friends and soon to be uh, co-creators. Uh, we were, to just keep sort of razzing on our own story, we were like sort of like failure musical theater students. We were there to be performers or so we thought um, and like to be on Broadway someday. Uh, but that quickly, I think we realized that that was not our destiny. We were not the most incredible dancers or singers or actors or whatever in our class. And so as sort of an act of protest, we started writing uh, songs for ourselves to sing since like no one wanted to put us in the shows, you know what I mean? <laughs> they, we were like, well, we can just write our own songs and then we're like, these are our songs because you don't want us to sing yours. Uh, so that's sort of what happened. Uh, and we sort of fell into, or not, uh, 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 fell into this, uh, this career of writing songs and, and writing music. And I think uh, sort of to, to start to connect it here, and you'll do a much better job of this, I'm sure, but um, I think the thing that we often think about in, in songwriting and in theater making is that it's obviously just a huge exercise in empathy. Um, I know you mentioned empathy before, um, but I think uh, uh, as we start to sort of scratch the surface of what theater and, and music making and what music does for us um, is the idea, even as theater kids, we got to play roles and we got to be in shows and that was uh, an escape. But I think what it also was, was the exercise of putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, and every time we go to the theater, that's what we're doing for an hour and a half or two hours or two or three hours or however long the show is. I hope it's not too long, but there's like a show at BAM that's like five hours long right I now. I saw it and it was four hours. It was, yeah. Okay, there you go. Um, uh, but for, how, for however many minutes your butt's in the seat, you are, um, you are exercising that empathy muscle. You are putting yourself in, an, in, in another person's shoes, on another person's walk, on another person's journey. Um, and I think that that is something that we're always thinking about in the work that we do, um, is someone that we don't understand, someone who's, whose life may look very different from us, um, yet in that moment as we're watching the show, we are sort of subconsciously living their journey along with them. Uh, and so I think there is something very communal about that. Um, there is something that requires us to think, what, what would our, my life be like if, if it were that? And I think the other thing that, we'll, that we talk about, and you'll talk about it again better than I do, is I think in the theater when we go there, um, or in a film or whatever it might be, especially when someone's singing in such a, an emotional sort of place, um, it, it I think it makes us feel um, seen, and I think it makes us feel a little bit less alone. I, I know even from having kids, um, so much of, of what we, my wife and I talk about with our kids is our kids, to solve their problems, so much of what they initially need is to just know that they're not alone in, in the things that they're feeling. And I think, just to scratch the surface, I think that that's what theater does when you're sitting watching someone else in a totally different context life journey and yet you see they're feeling these feelings that you know you've felt somewhere deep inside you're sort of like subconsciously realizing i'm not alone in this thing that i feel i'm not alone in this journey in this struggle the only thing i'd add to that is that when you also go to the theater or in a physical space you're watching you know you're watching this journey you're relating to it, it you know internally but you're also experiencing it with a group of people so the kind of collective um healing the, the collective you know healing I mean? of so like if, if if you guys all laugh together you realize oh the thing that i think is 
funny or the thing that is hitting me emotionally, the person next to me is also feeling emotionally or they also are recognizing that humor. The cure for loneliness, right, is community, essentially. The cure for addiction is community. So knowing that I, ha I have a recognition not just to this character on stage, but to this group of people who is seeing the world in the way that I'm seeing it, I think makes you feel like you are a part of something larger than yourself and, and you know, really then gives you, gives you hope that you're not in it you know, alone. And so that's the beauty of, I think, and the power of what we do. And then just to add to, to, to the music element, m music is a universal language. So, you know, it, it hits your soul. It hits you on a soul level. And, and it, it, it demands that you feel. Um, and so you get to have, you get to spy on a character. You get to go inside a person's head. You get to go inside their, their head and their heart simultaneously. So I think that the combination of all of those things is a really, really beautiful way to just relate to other people, uh, relate to stories, relate to characters, and then also just really define community. Um, and so that's you know, why we love what we do and, and really think that there's great power in it when harnessed you know, appropriately. I see what you guys just did, right? They set the bar low. They knock it out of the park like That's this. That's all we have to say on the that subject, was, though, so like, just I listen mean, to them for now. That was a grand slam. <laughs> Alec, I want you to, to give us a sense of the scope right now, the mental health crisis. We hear so much about it. We read so much about it. Give us some perspective as to where we stand in 2022, coming out of, hopefully, this pandemic situation. Where, where do we stand? All right, well, let me, let me give it uh, context, I guess, in three pieces. One is pre-pandemic, one is this post-pandemic, if you want to call it that, and then who's most impacted. Pre-pandemic, one in five is the number everybody goes with. You know what that one in five is? One in five of us has a mental disorder. One in five of us in this room, if it's 150 people, let's say 30 of us have depression or bipolar illness or OCD. And if you're a lucky one to not be afflicted, it's your partner, it's your child, it's your parent. So we all in this room know somebody who's experienced a mental disorder. Am I right? That was before the pandemic. And we talk about young people because that's my area of interest and, and, and commitment. Before the pandemic, one in five high school kids seriously considered suicide in the past year. That's not right. That shouldn't be one in five kids seriously considered suicide. And another one in five were cutting themselves and burning themselves in what's called non-suicidal self-injury. Why do they do that? To regulate their emotions. Why do they regulate their emotions that way? Because they don't have the coping skills yet to manage their distress. So that's pre-pandemic. Then you move into the pandemic and it's a mental health tsunami the likes of which no one has ever seen in our careers. Right, so The Lancet published an article about a year ago saying that the rates of anxiety and depression went up another 25%. So if you're doing your math, so one in five before the pandemic, throw another 25% of more anxiety and depression, and now we're talking about half the population is suffering from a mental health problem. Suicide rates go, go up in terms of suicide attempts, self-injury went up 300% for adolescents before the pandemic to during the pandemic. And who's most impacted by this? Women, young people, and I, I include college age in that because they have been grossly impacted. So children, adolescents, and college age, and people of color. And so we have to figure out a way to help the women, the young people, and the people of color to help them get access to care and be able to work on these mental health problems that are so pervasive in our society. So, I know the New York Times came out with an article about a week or two ago saying, oh, those mental health people, they're really blowing things out of proportion to bring up more business. Please, God, we don't need more business. And, and, and yes, it is true. It makes sense. If we have a once a century pandemic, we're anxious and depressed. I get that. But what I'm trying to convey to you is this has been a growing problem for decades. This has been out of control for decades. And now, it obviously, we've tipped, we've tipped over. There's nowhere to get help. There's no there's no provide even self care even self pay you can't find providers available to give service and then commercial insurance and medicaid it is wait lists of six months to a year so we have to figure out other solutions which i know we're going to talk about tonight and I, and I know jim will talk about the international scope of this but i wanted to give you just a thumbnail of the u.s situation how do you know you have a real issue you know everyone feels blue at least from time to time we all feel that but how do you know 
How, do, what do you, how can you tell? Well, when you know you have a disorder is when it's impairing your functioning, right? So we all feel blue sometimes, but is it getting in the way of your relationships? Is it affecting your workplace or your educational setting? So is it affecting functioning is really the, the true test of that. And how long do those symptoms last? And it's usually several weeks or more, let's say, for depression for that to be evident. Duration, basically. Okay. Jim, I'm wondering if you see parallels to the current crisis in this country um, to dealing with TB and AIDS. Are you seeing any, any similarities in, 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 uh, in what's out there and it gives you a chance to, to go at it, to attack it? Yeah, one of the things that keeps happening over and over again is that the public health community has been, um, I, in, a, in a very disappointing way, ready to give up too quickly on so many things. So we gave up too quickly on drug-resistant TB. Um, we, we gave up too quickly on, uh, on HIV treatment in Africa. We gave up too quickly on COVID. So uh, when, when COVID started, uh, we started screaming. We said, you know, we, we need to do as much as we can to do contact tracing to figure out where is this bug going, even if we're not going to be able to get all the, the people covered, even if we're not going to be able to do contact tracing with everybody, we need to figure out what's happening here. And the, and the public health community, some of them, you know, at, at, at the greatest institutions were saying things like, oh, well, you know, this is just too much. It's going to move too quickly. We don't have the people. I mean, we didn't have testing and all kinds of other things. But we saw it again. There was a kind of collective resignation. And this is why the public health community has you know, very little credibility now in, in this country. I don't know why it is. Uh, but uh, for some reason, there is this resignation that happens to us when we're facing these kinds of issues. The reason we were successful with HIV wasn't because of the public health community. It was because of gay men's health crisis, of uh, the Treatment Action Coalition. And, and, and you know these guys who were part of ACT UP in a development that I think just is not appreciated, they said, OK, we fought very hard for treatment for us. But we are not going to let this treatment only be given to rich people who look like us. We insist that these treatments go to people in Africa. So they, they literally took over buildings. They would put suits on and sneak up into the offices of Pfizer and take over the, the executive suite. They would chain themselves to the White House uh, gates. And that's what was needed to get things moving. Now, I'm not quite sure how that will take shape with, uh, with mental health. But unfortunately, I don't think disruption is going to happen from within the public health community. I don't think it's going to happen from within uh, academia. You know, I don't think the public system is going to uh, uh, disrupt itself. Something has to happen. I'm not quite sure what it is yet, but um, I think uh, we have an attitude problem. We have an attitude problem. A will problem. problem. There's still the sense that, well, you know, the uh, uh, the, the mentally ill you will always have with you, right? right? And it's probably okay now as long as they're not homeless on the street and bothering me. I, I think there's a sense of that. And so uh, the, the flip side of it is we've got to get people excited about what's on the other end. If we can go from 6% successfully treated to 50%, oh my god, we may even be able to take a big chunk out of the stigma against uh, uh, mental illness. We, you know, the stigma against HIV, uh, people living with HIV, just vanished when it was the worst stigma we'd ever seen. Right like in the history right. of, the, of civilization, Truly. it just vanished. What if we could do something like that? There's some great, great quotes attributed to you. I jotted them down. You said one time, when people ask you to do things that seem impossible, say yes and say yes and just give it a shot. That's what you said. You said the key, to ha the key is to have pessimism of the intellect, but an optimism of the will. Stop and think about that one. That's just your attitude. Well, is there enough of that around? Uh, you know, the, 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 that's a quote from a great Italian philosopher and politician named Antonio Gramsci. Yes, right? but you keep repeating and it. I keep repeating it. <laughs> I keep repeating it because, you know, academics have a tremendous pessimism of the intellect, meaning they suspect everything. They, they, they look at all the data. They, they argue about what's good data, what's bad data. But they kind of give up on these, you know, big, important problems because they don't think they can do anything about it. So uh, you, if you're just stupidly optimistic, then you're going to goof up. But if you can maintain sort of equipoise about science, and then when the science is really good, 
you know, the optimism of the will kicks in and you take on these projects, um, it's, I think it's the best, comp uh, uh, the best combination. Wow. Um, you guys, since you did Evan Hansen, people have been coming to you with their problems, right? They come to you, they write you, they see you, they ask you. How do you handle that? How does that change the way you, you, you live your life, you conduct business, the way you treat people and deal with people? Oh my. Um, you know, I think, I think that it's a, it's a real honor to have created something that resonates with people. I think when we created it, we were trying to identify something in ourselves that felt honest and real and a little scary and dark. And you never really know um, when you raise your hand and say, hey, I feel a certain type of way, whether or not it will resonate with other people. And in the creation of the show, what kind of blew us away is that so many people said, oh my, uh, me too. Um, and that, that is a really intense thing. And I think for us, you know, we are lucky that we are the writers and we're not the actors. The actors, people come to them every single night. The show is, you know, the, the show has existed in many, you know, cities and countries and, and, and folks will come to the actors and, and they feel like they've had this experience where someone has given them permission to admit something that they felt like they had to be alone in never discussing, or they felt that they had to be alone in never being able to admit out loud. And the process of seeing the show and seeing it with an audience gives them that permission to say, oh my gosh, I, I've seen something that makes me feel like I relate to one of these characters. It's um, literally like therapy. It really yeah. is, right? And so, you know, it's been an, a really interesting process of, of having to, you know, we've had to, uh, with the, the show as a whole, give the actors a process with how they are able to help facilitate um, connections to organizations that are leading this cause. Jed being Jed, one Jed of them. being one of them. Yeah, and I think the cool, I think that the really beautiful, and moving thing is, at first, it was I think felt like a burden, and I think people felt ill-equipped and like, oh, no one, no one anticipated that being a part of what that show was, and so people would come up to the actors, that act, especially the actors, not so much us, but I mean, we hear from folks, but they would come up and say, you know, your performance or your character saved me or whatever, and really share intimate um, details of their lives. And I think the actors were like, oh my God, that's amazing, but like they felt ill-equipped. But the sort of like result of all that was the show partnering with organizations that were, were equipped there to help, uh, and then sort of created a bridge from fans reaching out either at the stage door or writing to the show or people involved with the show to say, hey, here's what I've gone through and this, this show made me feel seen or I feel like I can, I can admit this now or whatever it is. And then that became a bridge to, it's, we're so honored to hear from you. We have folks that are standing by or that are here that we want to connect you with. Um, and so it really took on a life that we had you know, never imagined. And it went a little bit from a burden to actually we have this amazing opportunity to be a bridge to connect folks to the right people to help them continue on their journey. It's heavy for a couple guys who didn't set out to do any such thing. <laughs> I mean, right? How do you feel about that? I think that storytelling is as old as humanity, and we look to stories to try to understand ourselves. So if this is you know, a, a, the, the crisis that we know that it is, how do we continue to tell these stories so that people can say, oh, gosh, I." I really do feel like I am seen and heard, and I, 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 there's an admission. Um, and, and then, how do we partner with the folks who are doing that kind of work? So, the, what is it? What is the responsibility of folks like us who are storytellers and creators? And how do we put stories on stage or in film or in music that really do um, illuminate the crises that are happening? And you know, it, it feels like an opportunity more than anything else. And and that's you know. It's, it's heavy and it's also exciting and it's also something that it feels like a responsibility. Right. Alec, I want to take this into the realm of sports for just a second here. The last couple of years we've seen the likes of Naomi Osaka bowing out at the top of the game because of mental health issues. Ben Simmons, right, didn't want to play or didn't feel he was up to it. And then there are people who just don't buy it. They look at him and they say, come on, you guys have paid all this money, the, the whole thing, right? One of my friends, one of my kids, uh, teammates' grandfathers said to me the other day, he said, you know the trouble with these kids, these, these athletes, they're soft. Mm -hmm. Literally said that, and he believed that with all conviction. Um, what do you say to people like that who are skeptical about folks who, who, who react that way to the, 
to the moment. That's flawed thinking. That's outdated thinking. That's not compassionate ways of understanding. People are struggling, and we don't have to just say, suck it up, be tougher. That's, that's, that's old school. And for some athletes, maybe that works with some coaches or people in their family, come on, suck it up. But if you're suffering from a mental health problem and you're really anxious, and whether it be Simone Biles or anyone else who's afraid that their anxiety is gonna cause them to flinch in such a way that they're gonna land and break their neck, God bless her for it's real. Huh? It's real. It's real. We have to respect that. Give them them space and figure out how to manage their anxiety, learn some strategies, and get back on the bar if they want to choose to do that. Who are we to decide what their life is going to be like? They're in the public you know, sphere, and we obviously are fans, and we want our, you know, our people to do their thing, but we have to have greater compassion and more understanding for the fact there's real mental health issues, and we need to support that. Can I, can I, so we were just talking before we came out here, and uh, I was telling Alec that um, you know, in Haiti, we had a lot of patients dying of tuberculosis. And nobody should ever die of tuberculosis. We had really good medicines to treat them. And then, um, so this was early on, 1988, when we just started our work. And we got everyone together, and um, Paul Farmer, who spoke, spoke fluent Creole, said, so why do you think these people died of tuberculosis? And everyone had a reason. Well, they were, suspicious, they were superstitious. They believed in voodooism, and they went to the voodoo priest. And he said, no. The one thing that we're going to promise ourselves is if there's ever a death from tuberculosis, it's our fault. And Alex said the same thing about suicide, which blew me away. The notion that we can, we, that if we put all the pieces in place, we can prevent uh, suicides among youth. That's amazing. I'd love to hear Alex talk about that. Yeah. It absolutely is our fault. We have to do better as a community. We have to do better in terms of educating the world about what mental health is. We have to understand what the risk factors are, what the protective factors are, how to link to treatment. We have to partner with all the people in here and outside of here to provide a net for people. We have to learn how to listen to people differently. And I cannot tolerate one suicide. When I joined this, this uh, field in 1995 and the director of the suicide clinic, the, the Surgeon General in 95 said, this is a national epidemic. You know how many suicides there were in the country? 30,000. 30,000. That's not including drug overdoses that are identified as drug overdoses. You know what the number is this year? 27 years later, it's 47,000. That's 50% increase. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. We have to do better. I cannot stand on my watch letting this happen. So I, I am committed for the rest of my career to figure out how to save lives. And I, I want to talk a little bit about some ideas on how to do that when we're ready. I was really surprised to read that exactly 59 years ago on Halloween 1963, President Kennedy signed what was called the Community Mental Health Center's Construction Act. Are you guys familiar with this? This plan was to build 1,500 community mental health centers across the country. They didn't have any long-term financing. They had, I guess, private grants and that kind of fizzled out, fell apart ultimately. This was a month before he died. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of such what seemed to have been a visionary plan, a bold plan um, that, that remains unrealized? And, and a lot of your work dealt with community in, in, in Africa, in Haiti, in Peru, in, in bringing community centers. You had the five S's, I think you call it. You build a, a, a place, you, you, put, you staff it up, stuff. Right? What are the other ones? You put you put all these different things together. You remember? Yeah. I can read it to you. Staff stuff, systems, uh, social support, right. and space. You, you got to have a space. You got to have systems, social support, yeah. staff, and stuff. But you but you're building community centers yeah. around the country. That hasn't happened. Is that part of what you're looking at going down the road? There are experiments all over the world that have been wildly successful. So, for example. Um, of my friend and colleague Vikram Patel at Harvard has shown that he, he went to, to very poor Indian villages and taught uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to illiterate women in Indian villages. And, the, and he measured outcomes from interventions by these uh, uh, village women, and the outcomes were stunning. So he got NIH grants, everyone's very excited about it. This could go to scale. In Zimbabwe, they tried something called the friendship bench. 
And they just, in, in, um, in Zimbabwe, elderly women are very important sort of uh, uh, mentors and, and, and sort of what, what an anthropologist would call a social sinosher, a person who keeps everybody together. So they, had, they put a bench in the front of the mental health center, and they had a granny sitting there, and they measured who sat with the granny and who didn't. And the people who sat with the granny had much better outcomes, like, like you know, 4x better outcomes for anxiety and depression. And so there are so many tools that have been proven. If you combined Vikram Patel's Empower program, where you teach uh, uh, CBT, what Alec has done at such an incredible level, to um, uh, you know, more and more people, which is I, my understanding is what Alec would like to see is for so many of us to be able to provide that kind of support. If you can do that in, in, village, in villages in India, why can't you do it in Irvington? Uh, friendship benches, put them out in front of different places, and it might not be grannies, it might be someone else, but you can train people to do that. So what Tom writes in his book, Healing, is that there are so many better therapies, digital therapies. You know, Harris and I were just at a conference in, in, uh, in Boston, the Mass General Hospital Psychiatry Conference. These digital tools also look, some of them, extremely effective. We're just not implementing, we're not getting them to people, right? Tom Insel, former head of the National Institute of Mental Health, says that, uh, that for anyone who has a psychotic break, the first psychotic break should be the last. And you can do that. You can prevent anyone from ever having a psychotic break again. That should be the standard of care. But of course, it's not the standard of care. So uh, it's, it's exciting. And the reason I say it's like HIV is because when, mm -hmm. when antiretroviral medicines came along, it turned uh, HIV from a, a uniformly fatal disease to one that is like a chronic illness, people's life expectancy was back to normal. Um, it, it, why aren't we doing that now with these wonderful new therapies that we have? And, and I, I, you know, I don't know the answer, but I, I, I also don't think that things will change on their own. I think we have yeah. to disrupt. Alec, why aren't we doing that? Well, I was going to say that you know I'm a big believer in what's called evidence-based medicine or evidence-based treatments, and if we're going to deliver these treatments, how do we disseminate and implement? And the problem is that our dissemination and implementation science research is in its nascent stages. How do you train an organization like a school to take something that works in a clinical setting and implement it effectively with their students? And, do, and what, what the schools all say is, we have such initiative fatigue. All these experts come in, they give a workshop, and then they leave. And so my business partner, Lana McGinn at, C at CBC, we say, if we're going to come and train you, we're going to also not leave for two years because we're going to come every other week and make sure that you get expert consultation on implementing the w thing that works here in your setting. And we're going to troubleshoot it. And to me, that's part of this implementation science research yeah. is how do you deliver it so it sticks? Because you go in and then it just evaporates and they're tired and then a new, a, a new shiny object comes in oh let's try this or let's try that and the schools are burned out and, and I'm, I'm very passionate when we talk about how to treat some of the problems can we get into schools as I said in the video in earlier ages and give them social emotional learning strategies how do you be mindful of your feelings in the moment and be less judgmental of your classmates how about that how about teaching distress tolerance skills so when I get angry, I don't have to punch the wall or cut myself. What can I do differently? How do I manage my emotions? This is not rocket science. We can go and train people to do this. And I love Jim's point about being able to go into community settings and training others. Not, so we're training the school personnel to do this with their students. We can go to other settings and work in their communities too. But we need expert treatments and expert trainers and then consult and make sure it sticks. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the recipe for success. What are the metrics you're going to be working with as we go forward here that tell us we've reached a place that is better, is okay? And, and what does that look like? What does better look like? Well, I talked a little earlier about people of color um, being really suffering. There are only about 3.5% of psychologists in the United States are black, about 3.8% Hispanic. So when I talk about metrics, I want to figure out a way we can train more therapists of color so that they can also service more clients of color, so that they can also go to under-resourced communities and kids can say, oh, that person is like me. 
You know, uh, I just, Francis Diafo at the U.S. Open said, with the Williams sisters, that's who I want to be. And I feel like it's unacceptable to me in this level, too, that we have not figured out solutions to be, be able to train more black and brown therapists to be able to roll into communities and help their people feel like, I am here, I'm here to help you, and that is a critically important next step for us. That's, what, one, that's one step when we talk about metrics. Sure. What, what other data do you want to see, or what, what, well, what, what is it going to look well, like when I mean, we reach you know, yeah. a place that's, that's, that's right, that's good? I want zero suicide. I want zero suicide. That's my goal. Uh, obviously, th that's some work to be yeah. done since we've gone up 50% uh, in the last 25 years. Uh, yeah, I want people to be able to know how to access care and how, where do I go? Can I get it? Can I get it affordably? Um, can I get evidence-based care? So I want to know that we're delivering. There's a lot of people doing talk therapy, and I'm not here to badmouth talk therapy, but if you have a major mental disorder where you have OCD, you have panic disorder, you have you know, suicidal behavior. You can't just do traditional talk therapy. You need to go to, to some specialist who knows how to treat that. And it doesn't have to be lifelong. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to disseminate treatments that work in places where people can get them. Yeah. So well, that, that, suicide. Yeah. Any, any young person who has a psychotic break, that will be their last psychotic break. Yeah. But there was just a paper today in the Journal of the American Medical Association saying, and it was uncanny, Tom Insel, the author of Healing, sent it to me. And it said, we should learn from the HIV folks. You know, the goal in HIV is 90, 90, 90. 90% 90 of people know their status. 90% of people are on antiretroviral therapy. 90% of people are, have, a, have an undetectable viral load. And we're like at 78, 78, 78. And it, it, it's unthinkable when, where we were in 2003 that we'd be there now. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's, a, he's a mental health provider. He said, let's go to 90, 90, 90 for mental health. Why the hell not? Right now, we're at 40, 40, 30, 6% overall. Why can't we get to 90? 90% uh, uh, completely cured is hard, is harder. But 40, 40, 30 can easily get to you know, 80, 80, 60. And if you, if you could get the number of people who really get better up to 50%, as I said before, I think fundamentally stigma will shift. And when we say cured in mental health, some of these conditions are chronic, right? So I'm going to shoot for stable and managed. Cured, is that possible? I mean, I would say some of these conditions can go into full remission for the rest of your life. Right. Right. That's, my, that's my definition of cure. Right. Um, Justin and Bench, what are you guys working on next in this space? Jesters. <laughs> A five, six, seven. Hey! <laughs> what you got? <laughs> Couple little ditties, you know. Uh, um, no, uh, uh, <laughs> we uh, we we've got. I mean, we've got a we've got a, a, a movie that's coming out next month. That's a, a fun holiday little uh, uh, film starring Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds and Octavia Spencer, um, and it's just a fun little holiday. It's called Spirited. It's sort of a loosely Christmas Carol adjacent. Um, it's coming it's out not November 16th. I just saw it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, okay then. You guys have to understand, we, we were in the office I'm back there. He, he's, he, 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 he <laughs> truly, like, he was showing us videos of him singing as the president of Dartmouth. We were like, get out of here. <laughs> um, no, but it's, it is interesting. It's uh, to, to, again, try to wind our way to connecting to... to Good to luck on this one. This evening. No, what I was going to say is, like, in terms of uh, sort of what from our end at all there is for us to do. I think one of the things, um, it, I think the experience of Evan Hansen definitely um, was rewarding, of course, because it was a, um, an original story, and so that felt I important to tell. But in terms of connecting with people, and in terms of people feeling like they were seeing themselves, and having the experience of being able to talk about their experience or be vulnerable about those things or, or talk with their family. I think that's the other thing I think that in terms of breaking stigma or in terms of um, connecting and awareness of, the, uh, of these issues, you know, there was a lot of folks who would say, 
I felt like seeing this with my mom, I could now talk about. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's how, kind of how I felt, you know? The, and like, I didn't ever know, I didn't have the vocabulary for it. I didn't have the way to talk about those issues, but I'm like, they would say, I'm like that kid, or a parent would say, I feel like that parent, I feel like I don't know how to get, and that started to break open conversations. And so I think, in terms of what we're working on next, one of the things that we're focused on in terms of for theater is, I think what we wanna do, and we have like a very, very sort of rough, loose idea of something, but uh, is a, a desire to write an, a, another piece that hopefully is something where people can come to and feel like um, they're, you know, I, just to connect it for a minute, for me personally even, I feel like even just like times through middle school and high school and whatever, uh, there were certain musicals and there's like, I can think of particular songs or even that. I didn't know what I was experiencing at the time, but um, the loneliness that I felt in my personal life, I truly, I realize now, like there was a character singing about a feeling that I didn't realize I was having myself, but I was very much having myself. And like, I truly did feel like that, that was my friend a little bit in that moment. That was my community. That was like, I felt, I truly felt seen. And so I think we have a desire to, to write another show, this particular one we're thinking about that hopefully uh, speaks to, again, uh, uh, an experience that we all have um, in, in processing our feelings and processing uh, maybe uh, uh, earlier trauma or just, or, or, or sort of speaking to that sort of younger version of ourselves and unpacking the things we went through in our past and and how to heal that in order to heal ourselves. You, I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, but yeah, I mean, it definitely feels like okay. That's now important for us to do. I think is it, to keep it, trying to do that it goes without being repetitive, though. Yeah, right? yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. Tough yeah. Trick. Well, God, thanks, more. I mean, yeah, you know, wow. We're try. <laughs> um, no, I, I think here we go again. Hey, no, I, I think it is. It's about being deliberate, and it's, a, it's a, about a sense of responsibility. And also, you know, we've we've uh, been lucky to have a lot of opportunity that we're now moving into a stage where we can facilitate other people and, and shape, we can give opportunities to other people. So uh, that's been really interesting. We were on a call today uh, about a show that we're trying to uh, uh, figure out for a, a songwriter who experienced sexual assault in her life and has never figured out how to talk about it or never really articulated how to really share that story and that has tremendous mental health implications. So, you know, how do we use our position, um, you know, as, as people who have had success in our fields and also just societally, the things that we've inherited in terms of our privilege, like how do we then extend that to other people whose stories might not be ours, but that, um, that need to be told? And so I think that, you know, it's about examining uh, from a, a sense of privilege and, uh, uh, how do we how do we use that effectively to really make sure that we're we're stewarding stories that can be effective and that can create conversation? Have you guys read Healing? Healing no. the Musical. No. Hey, you heard it here first. I, heard it, I was going to say, yeah, you heard it. Healing the Musical. I mean, there's so many unbelievable stories in that book, right? I'm going to pick up a copy. Yeah. There's one and, in your and, bag, Benjamin. And Alec, the other one, the other thing is, that, you know, I I I read from now from my friends that that. Uh, I, I talked to, they said that, that for people who are suicidal, even reading stories of people who've tried and failed and then now have a different perspective, that that's helpful and that's also been studied. Is that, is that correct? I haven't seen that study, but no. I can imagine for some people that could be helpful, for others, who I, knows? I'm not sure. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. You just have to keep, yeah. keep, keep at it until you find that thing which is helpful. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, we're at a point where I think we could, we could do some final thoughts here, um, Dr. Kim. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts going forward as you try to take this thing on? It's a lot. It, it's a lot, and you know, I, I, I feel like I'm 62, so I feel like I have w at least one more gig in me. Uh, the, I, you know, the, the daunting thing is that this is much more complicated than any of the movements we've tried before, but it's also much more compelling, and it's, there's just many, many more advocates, I think, out there in the world, and anyone who's had a relative. I mean, this, you know, um, Harris and, and, and Mrs. Schwartzberg, you know, the, the, the family stories are the ones that motivate people. And I, I think we can, I think we can uh, put together a movement that would involve a much broader cross-section of society. That's what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a movement and it's going to take fundamental disruption. I think from the private sector, I don't see how the public sector will d disrupt itself. And so, um, I, you know, I've made, um, a promise to myself that uh, that 
that uh, this is my next gig, uh, and and we'll see where it goes. I, I, I you know, I, I have a pessimism of the intellect, but an optimism of the will. Love that, Alec. Well, first of all, I love your music and shows, and I do think they're great stories, and I think they do start conversations, so keep on doing that, guys. I really love your stuff. Jim, I also love the disruptor concept. I, I think we have to all think about what that means and how that looks in concrete terms. My heart of hearts, as I've said to you before, I really feel like I want to start early. I want to go into elementary schools and middle schools and give everyone tools. And we teach English and math and science and social studies, great stuff. But how about just life skills to cope with everyday life that we're all dealing with? And how is that not happening in this 21st century? So I am 100%, thank you. Okay. So, so that's where I want to put my, my next chapter uh, as well. How about, if, how about if we say thank you to Alec, Justin, Benj, and Dr. Kim? What a wonderful panel. Thank you, guys.